All right, let's get started, everyone. How's everyone doing? Still kicking? All right. Weather's been pretty nice, except for the coldness. Uh, so, is it nine below this morning? Anybody have anything lower? Nine? Fifteen, you see here? Okay. Fifteen below the counter? Okay. All right. Uh, a couple of announcements here to pass along to you. Uh, the newsletters for February are in the back over there, and so make sure to grab one of those. And uh, so we kind of pick a theme for each month. And so the theme for this month is this idea of tolerance versus love. And we'll be talking about that in the upcoming weeks. And so we'll uh, handle that as our topical study here in the month of February. Uh, next week, we will be doing, um, with respect to Genesis 1 through 4, I haven't quite got, got, got there yet as far as preparations, but we'll be doing some videos uh, to help out with that, to kind of supplement some of the different things we've been talking about. That'll be next Wednesday. And so we'll have a, potentially a couple CDs or DVDs um, and then a couple of YouTube videos here to kind of highlight different uh, aspects of Genesis 1 through 4. So that'll be next week as kind of as we're trying to kind of summarize and pull things uh, together here and end things for Genesis 1 through 4. So keep that in mind as well. Any other announcements that I may have missed? Oh, I should mention uh, tomorrow we are having the funeral service for Roger Knoll. Uh, Roger has been on our shutting list for some time. And so um, some people, some individuals were exactly who Roger is. Yeah, he's been on one of our shut-in shut lists, so we getting regular visits, so he passed away this last week. So funerals on Monday for Roger. And then the church office will be opened on Monday due to the funeral, but then will be closed on Friday. Uh, Joanna usually puts in four days a week, and so since she's going to be working on Monday, uh, I'll be taking Friday off. Uh, let's just to make you informed of that as well. So Ultra Circle will meet on Thursday instead of Friday. Okay? All right. Any other announcements that I need to mention? Okay. All right. If you get a chance, um, we got we got Cheryl back there, new member, and Cynthia over here, transfer. So make sure to greet both of them. So Cheryl back there, came remember last week. Cynthia transferred again. What was the church again transferred from? Our Savior Lutheran in Rockwall. Rockwall? Yes, Rockwall, Texas. Texas, okay. So we have a Texan up here. <laughs> And we were talking, uh, we're, uh, Cynthia and I were talking about the weather, and uh, we are talking about when you get a dry cold, a dry cold, right? You know how that goes? Like a dry cold of 5 above, and it's dry cold, versus 25 above and, 25 above and a cold, a uh, little bit of moist cold. I'll take 5 above. And so some more. Yeah. <laughs> so, good. All right, let's pray. We'll jump into things, okay? Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of your word to us and for us. Bless our conversation, our study of Genesis 1 through 4 this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, today's theme we're going to be looking at is the word enmity, E-N-M-I-T. It's hostility or conflict or tension. So we're going to look at this tension and this conflict that is introduced in Genesis 3. And we're going to see how that bleeds over to Genesis 4. Uh, we, see some, we have some really good comments from Luther on this with respect to Cain and Abel in chapter 4. And so we want to jump into this idea of enmity. So if we look at Genesis 3 in our Bible, we want to keep in mind after Adam and Eve ate of the fruit in the garden, uh, the Lord God, he comes before them. They go and hide, cover themselves with fig leaves. He calls them out, and then he speaks to the serpent so the Lord is speaking to the serpent in chapter uh, 3, verse 14. The Lord God said to the serpent in verse 14, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. Now here's, here's the key. I will put enmity okay, between you, that's the serpent, and the woman. Okay, There will be tension between... The devil and the woman. Now it's interesting. And between your offspring, that's the seed. Okay, the word offspring is also seed. The seed or offspring of the devil and her offspring. Okay. Now this is in the plural. So this is the offspring, the seeds of the devil, the seeds of the woman, the offsprings. Then it goes to the singular. He shall bruise your head. He's saying to the devil that he, now that narrows it from 
the plural to a singular, that he, a singular, shall bruise your head, speaking to the devil, and you shall bruise his heel. Okay? So we see enmity there being introduced, tension. Okay? So let's look at our sheet here to expound on this a little bit. Right after the sinful rebellion of Adam and Eve, the Lord God made a promise. I will put enmity between thee, Satan, and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. That's from the King James. Sometimes the King James is helpful when it has the thee and the thous and the thys. Uh, what that does is it actually communicates the singular and the plural, which is very, very helpful. Many times in the New Testament, when the... Uh, uh, authors in the New Testament, when they speak with the word you, we do not pick up on whether it's singular or plural. Okay? So <clears throat> if we were to say, now speaking of Texas, if we were to go to Texas, if I were to speak to a group, I'd say, hey, y'all. Right? That's the plural. <laughs> However, when we, when we look at the Greek, uh, in, in, in the translation from Greek to English, the word you can refer to singular or plural. There are many times where Paul will say, the Lord be with y'all, okay? And technically, that's how we should say it. And so the, the King James is very helpful that it has the these and the thous and the thys to show the difference between the singular and plural. And so what I'm saying here is with this, that there will be offsprings, there will be tension between the offsprings of Eve and the offsprings of what? The devil. But there will be... One of the offspring, the seed, he or it, is, is how it's translating it. He shall what? Bruise thy head. Whose head? The devil's. And the devil, and thou the devil, shalt bruise his heel. This is referring to the Messiah, referring to what? This great uh, battle that's going to happen at the cross where Jesus himself, his what? Heel is bruised, or, or his heel is what? get bruised, but the head of the serpent is what? Crushed. If you've ever seen The Passion of the Christ with Mel Gibson, okay? In the very early portions of Mel Gibson's movie, has Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, and the serpent comes out so that it shows, it shows the devil himself. And what they actually did for casting, they actually cast a female character, and they gave her a male voice. That's why the devil is so eerie. There's a sense when you look at the devil in that movie, uh, there's, there's, a, there's a femininity to the, to the devil. But then when the devil speaks, there's a very grovelly male voice. And so the devil is standing there, and then all of a sudden underneath the devil, this serpent comes out between the legs, comes over, and starts slithering over Jesus when he's in the Garden of Gethsemane. And then he rises. If you remember that scene, he rises and shows the snake, and all of a sudden, Boom, the foot comes down and crushes the head of Satan. And when I was in the theaters watching, everyone jumped, you know. And it took every ounce of my body not to yell out, Genesis 3.15, Genesis 3.15. <laughs> so, boom, it's like, oh, there's that. I'm like, Genesis 3.15. That's what Mel was pulling from in that movie was the crushed, you know, the head of, of the serpent. Okay. But nonetheless, the point being is that there's enmity. Okay. Back to our sheet. Furthermore, this enmity, hostility and hatred, will continually exist between the seed of the devil and the seed of Eve. Simply stated, Genesis 3.15 establishes that there will be conflict and hostility between the children of God and those of the devil, those blinded by darkness. Keep in mind, though, the beginning portion of verse 15 speaks collectively to Satan and the powers of darkness versus Eve and the children of God. However, the seed of Eve narrows when it is referenced in the singular, the seed shall crush the head of Satan. And so the point is that that's being made is that there is no such thing as peace and tranquility between the forces of darkness and God's children. There is no middle ground between Christ and the devil. There is no middle ground between light and dark, good and evil. There's only hostility. There's only enmity. Okay, so pause there. Does that make sense? Okay. This is why in the New Testament, when the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the, the uh, scribes, when they went after Jesus, 
they first went through, they were bantering back and forth, talking with him, challenging him. Then as things intensified, they then accused him of having a what? Having a demon. What they were attempting to do was what? Put him on the forces of darkness. They're attacking his character. It's what we call an ad hominem. They're going against his character. And what Jesus points out, he goes, truly, right, if I am of what? If I'm of the devil, why would I, if I'm of the devil and of the forces of darkness, why would I then attack the forces of darkness by casting out demons? Why would a house stand against itself? It doesn't make sense. That makes sense? So his whole point was there is no middle ground, left or right, okay, or darkness or, or light. And if I'm of the devil, then why am I attacking my own house? That makes sense? Okay. So there's war between the two. Okay. So the continued battle, let's look at the bottom right. We'll start fleshing this out here a little bit. It could be said that the rest of the Bible, continuing from Genesis 3 and onward, is a narration of the enmity between the seed of the devil and the seed of Eve. For example, David and Goliath is a battle between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. When I was a kid, and, 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 and I, I get so frustrated with this, when I was a kid, I remember being in vacation Bible school and hearing about David, and it was always communicated, wouldn't you like to be David too, right? And, and, and what are the Goliaths in your life? And, and so forth. And remember as a kid making a tinfoil little rocks and flinging them at a big statue of Goliath and feeling I was like, what, David? And it's, it's this wonderful story that we're supposed to emulate David. But if, it, all that it, if that's all that we see that it is, we're missing the bigger picture. The bigger picture is this. With David and Goliath, you see a continuation of this great enmity, this battle between the serpent and Eve, the offspring of the serpent and the offspring of Eve. And as we know, through the lineage of Eve, all the way through um, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and then down to David, the promised seed is going forth to bring forth what? The birth of the Messiah into time and space, right? In, in human time and space. Now, Jesus is... Eternal, obviously, but he put on human flesh through that lineage of Eve to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and then to David. So if David would have died against Goliath, uh, theoretically, no Jesus, right? No, no incarnation, right? And so when we look between Goliath and David, was there any possibility of Goliath winning? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. But what we see there is we see Genesis 3, the enmity between the devil and Eve, and we see that on display between David and Goliath. Now get this. After David threw those stones at Goliath, he hit the ground. Now it's speculated whether or not Goliath was really dead at that point or not. Uh, I believe if we look at the text, I'm not sure it quite says whether or not he's dead or not. But nonetheless, which I have on my computer screen, if you go to my office, if you go on the computer screen, you have my computer screen shows David holding what? Standing over a decapitated body, holding a big head up. And I love that picture. The kids come in like, whoa. And I just I just love it. There's another picture too that was done. I don't know if it was Michelangelo that did it, but it's a really, you know, like those uh, Mona Lisa paintings, how nice they have a nice flowing hair, right? There's a picture of David and he's standing there, he's got a sword over his shoulder and he's kind of rugged looking and nice complexion. And then all of a sudden in his right hand, he's got what? A head with no body. And he's got this huge sword. What, what just happened? Cut the head off of Goliath. Now, think of Genesis 3.15. He shall what? Crush your head, right? But you will strike his heel. What happened to Goliath? His head was decapitated. Now, part of me, you know, links that back to what? Genesis 3.15 of the head of the serpent, the head of the offspring of the devil, Goliath, being decapitated by the promise of the Lord. But again, we see what? Enmity. We see strife between the offspring of the devil and what? The offspring of Eve. Okay? So we see that through the rest of the scriptures as well. That conflict. We look at Jezebel in the Old Testament. There's conflict there between her and uh uh, the, the prophets of God. We look into the New Testament, we see the Pharisees and the Sadducees and so forth, they're attacking what? Christ. 
We look at the Apostle Paul against the Judaizers being flogged and being what? Persecuted. We see that ongoing conflict. We could even see that conflict in the 1500s with the Reformation between what? The Reformers standing on the gospel and at that time the very oppressive and ruthless Catholic Church wanting to what? Smite the Reformers and essentially putting a death uh, sentence upon Luther himself. We see this continued enmity and strife between those two offsprings. Okay? So, thoughts on that with David and Goliath? Does that kind of put it in a bigger perspective? Okay? So, yeah, it's a cool story between what? A shepherd boy flinging a rock. Okay? But it's much bigger than that. It's the ongoing eternal battle, all the way back to Genesis 3, that battle between the forces of evil and we could say the forces of good. Okay? between offspring of the devil and offspring of Eve. Okay? Thoughts? Feedback? Okay. You guys, looks like it's, it's tracking. <laughs> Keep on moving on? Yeah, Rudy. I had a question. Uh, your very first sentence there, it says right after the sinful rebellion of Adam and Eve, Explain how theirs was a rebellion. Yeah, so it's a rebellion from the perspective that God said what? You know, eat from any tree except for this tree. And Adam and Eve desiring to be what? Like God. And so rebellion is any time that we think of a rebellion. Um, uh, rebellion is, is any time that we d disobey an authority, right? What is a rebel? So you think of a high school rebel, what does a high school rebel do? The principal says, don't do this, and the what? They do the opposite, right? Yeah, they do the opposite. So we think of uh, some of the different movies, the rebels are those that are always what? Rebelling against the authority. So God gives a spoken word, and the devil gives what? Did God really say? So Adam and Eve, they rebelled against God's word, and they listened to the word of Satan. And as we covered a couple weeks ago, Adam and Eve, they did fall, but the fall was what we talked about it being an upward fall. In other words, don't eat from this tree of knowledge of good and evil, because then you will be like God, right? And the devil comes along and says, hey, did God really say, don't you want to be like God? And so in, this, in essence, it's Adam and Eve rebelling and intruding into the things that are not of them, but are of what? Of God himself. And this is what the human nature is. Our human nature, we tend to what? Want to be gods ourselves. We like to what? Take over and be in control. So it, it's interesting to think about this way. Um, I remember once upon a time, somebody said to me, they said, you know, Pastor Richard, you make it sound out like we humans um, are like a like a block of wood that we're just that we 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 fail in everything we do we 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 don't you know if this is the good right here that we're just kind of like blah we don't do anything and I said no no it's actually much worse it's much worse than that uh, the Book of Concord talks about this it says that we humans if this is God's standard okay we humans. The, the Book of Concord says we humans are not like a block of wood or a stone. In other words, we're not just, you know, stuck in the mud. It actually says that we are much worse. We're an active rebellion. We're actually doing the opposite. So it's much, much worse. Okay. So, so we can think of maybe a stick shift, right? A stick shift. Let's just make a simple stick shift. Stick shift. Forward, neutral, or reverse, right? So we'd want to be in forward, right? That's good. Neutral, we're not moving, and reverse. So if we think of our human nature, our human nature is not in forward to God, apart from Christ, our human nature apart from Christ is not forward towards the good. Our Book of Concourse is not even neutral. We're actually what? We're actually in reverse with no stick to shift, <laughs> okay? Imagine being in the car, and you're going backwards off of a cliff, you're going to what? Try to hit the brakes and what? Reach for the stick shift to shift it out of reverse to go forward. But imagine that car going backwards and you come to hit the brakes and there's no brake pedal and you look down, there's no stick to shift. That is, that's who we are by nature. And so you would say, well, how do we fix it? And the answer is, we can't. 
we need to be rescued from this body and this world of sin and death. We need to be rescued. That means we need to be plucked out of darkness onto light. We need a divine rescue, somebody to come in the car and take us out. And then that's essentially what the gospel is. Metaphorically, Jesus comes, kicks us out of the car, and he's in the car, and he goes over the cliff on our, on our stead, on our behalf. But the good news is he what rises from the dead, right? Putting an end to it. So this rebellion is Adam and Eve rebelling into that which is above them, not what? Trusting in the word of God, trusting in the word of Satan, and disobeying it, and intruding into the things that are not of their own. What's that? Did she gain anything? Did she, um, she, she gained what did she gain? She gained sin and death, you know. That's okay. um, so, so, God told him last week from the apostasy, and the devil says, Did he really say that? Yep. And they wanted, you're saying they wanted to be like God? So, so where did they think that they were going to be like God? Because they didn't do that. Well, that's going to be the temptation of the evil one. Did God really say? So we look, let's just look back at what he said. He said, um, let's, see, let's see, did God actually say you shall not eat of the, any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will surely, uh, you will not surely die. All right, so right there. So now we have two words. We have the word of what? The devil against the word of God. Two different words. Okay. The, yes. Yep. Yep. So so we could we could say we could say if it wasn't for the devil, theoretically we could say if it wasn't for the devil, what are they eating from the tree? Potentially not. But what happens? The devil came to what? Deceive. To trick. So who is the main instigator in this? It's... it's <laughs> <laughs> so the main instigator... <laughs> keep on. The main instigator in this is the devil, right? So he's the one that what initiated this. So again, what does the devil do? He attacks what? The word of God. So God says what? It's all good. Just don't what? Eat of this tree. Then the devil comes along and he says... Did God really say? I mean, this is how the devil attacks. Did God really say? Uh, you will not die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open. You will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate, and she gave some to her husband who was there with her, and he ate. Okay. So there's desire to what? To be like God, knowing good and evil. And so there's this invasion of Adam and Eve and an invasion to the things that don't belong to them. This is why we say we fear, love, and trust in God, right? And so when we say we fear, love, and trust in God, we understand that God is here and we're here. The Nicene Creed, what do we do in the Nicene Creed? We establish that there's a creator up here and we're the created. What ends up happening, though, in this world? We don't like this position of being the created, we, we want to be masters and commanders of the universe. So atheism, in a lot of ways, and agnosticism, it takes and it what? Kicks the Lord out, removes it, and then puts us where? In that spot. It's a rebellion of what? Of that authority. We want to be in control of our universe. But the problem is, can we uphold all the weight of the universe? Can we uphold all the weight of being a god unto ourselves? It's very, very difficult. It's a ton of pressure. Yes, Wade. I heard one, and I think it makes put a different light on this as well, is the devil actually fell because he was, humans were above angels. So the devil was actually envious of us in the first place, and that's why he fell. Hmm. Yeah. So it's just envious, it says. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, so keep in mind, again, 
the Lord did not create the evil, right? He created that which is good. Um, evil is perverting that which is good. Uh, evil is perverting its, its, its... So you think about marriage, to give me an example. Uh, marriage is instituted by God. Marriage has wonderful gifts. But when we take, uh, for instance, sex itself, when we take it outside of marriage, then it becomes that which is a good gift for mutual um, uh, enjoyment of a husband and wife, the procreation of children, all that. Something that's wonderful and beautiful, when you take it out of that, it's actually perverted and it's used in a way that can actually hurt people. Okay, um, So we think about how that works. So God has set everything up that's good and true, and the devil, all he does... Now keep in mind, the devil can't create... The devil cannot create anything. He can only pervert what is good. And so evil, we have to understand that evil is not like an alternative kingdom with its own rules. Okay, Evil itself is taking that which is good and twisting it and perverting it into an alternative reality or mimicking uh, something on the other side that's a perversion of what is good and true. So what does the devil, what does he do to make evil evil? He takes good gifts and he twists them. He flips them. Uh, he denies them. And so again, because the devil can't create. Go ahead. I think, uh, when I think about that specific question, I think of uh, So Jesus, who in the form of God, did not count the quality of God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself. So that was their violation. Christ being perfect. Um, did not count himself, you know what I mean? They did. Yep. They counted uh, something that equal to God, something to be grasped. Christ did not. Right. So their violation was obvious. I mean, they, they, they thought it was something to be grasped, and they didn't empty themselves. They departed. Yep. So think of the first commandment. Um, there's no other gods, right? That's the first commandment. That there's God here, no other gods except the Lord God Almighty. And one of the biggest ways that we violate that first commandment is we do what? We make ourselves what? God, into that spot. That is the number one way we, we violate the first commandment. Uh, we, we, we elevate ourself, our pride. That's what pride does. Pride, what, takes us from here and makes us here. And it, what, tries to invert that, right? To invert that. Make sense? Okay. All right, let's look at the very back for the sake of time. Peace, if possible, truth at all costs. Peace and harmony in the church are very good. However, they are not the highest ideal. Okay, it's going to be very, very important to understand. Peace and harmony in the church, they're very good. It's good to have peace. It's good to have harmony. However, they are not the highest good, the highest ideal. In other words, if a church is cozy, comfortable, it may not be a good thing. Now, it may, but it may not. Okay, um, The reason why? The church is not a church of ease, but the church militant. That is the point. The church itself is not the church of ease, but the church militant. Consider the following from C.F.W. Walther. Now, if you're not familiar with C.F.W. Walther, he was the first president of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. So he's one of the guys who came over from... Um, from Europe, when, when the Lutherans came over, they had several boats that they took across over to come to America. And we should look at the history sometimes. It's kind of fascinating. Uh, my understanding is as they left, they had several boats, and there's a big, big storm. And by the time they got all the storm, the one boat that had the organ, had all the vestments and all the hymnals, that one never made it. So when they got to America, they basically, they got here in one piece, but they had none of their church stuff with to set up the church. Uh, very, very fascinating. But anyway, Lu uh, Walther was amongst those people, and so he was the first president of the Missouri Synod. And so here's what Walther states. Now, this is, this is over 100 years old, what Walther states. He says, as soon as my word, that's the Lord's word, is proclaimed, men will divide into two camps. Some will receive it with joy, others will be offended by it, and will begin to hate and persecute those who receive. Walther goes on to say, the church cannot be built up in peace, for it is located within the domain of the devil, who is the prince of this world. Accordingly, the church has no choice but to be at war. It is the church militant and will remain until the blessed end. Wherever the church, wherever a church is seen to be not the church militant, but the church at ease, that, you may rely on it, is a false church. So the church itself is the church militant. 
And the reason being is this all goes back to what? Genesis 3. So properly stated, we the church here, St. Paul's, we are the church militant. We are at war. Okay? We're at war with what? The offspring of the devil. Okay? It is a spiritual war. Okay? And so the church itself, if it's seen as cozy, comfortable all the time, and not understood. Now, keep in mind, if we use the imagery of war, there are going to be times within the walls of the, the fortress, if you will, there'll be times within the walls of the fortress that there will be what? Birthdays and and uh, uh, birthdays and celebrations and so forth in the walls of the church. But when that's happening, they're always what? They're always guards on the what? Outside of the walls. Always attentive. Think of the epistles. What does Paul say a time and time again? Be sober-minded, to be alert, to be awake. Um, to be awake for the second coming of the Lord, but also awake for what? Ravenous wolves that seek to come and steal and destroy the flock. And so, when we understand the church, it is to be the church militant. Obviously, it is this way because of the enmity that was promised in Genesis 3. In other words, the church, pastor, and members cannot expect faithfulness apart from conflict with the devil, the world, and our old Adams. It is impossible to escape this enmity if we wish to be faithful servants of, of God. Peace if possible, absolutely. Truth at all costs. For without truth... Love is not possible, and without truth, we lose everything. Okay? So, do we think of the church that way? Is the church militant? I do know in Africa, um, many, many churches over there, they definitely understand that church militant. Definitely understand the church militant. Um, in America, though, do we understand it as church militant? I think we are now more so now than we were what? You know, 10 years ago, did we see the church as much militant as it is now? Absolutely not. It's becoming more and more militant. Uh, perhaps we could say the reason why it's more militant is because our culture that we live in is becoming much more secularized, we would say. Yes, Bo? Well, I would say it's also because it's more obvious it's not just being a spiritual war, but also a physical, in the world, actual battle, actual war. Because the world is more obviously, in, or at least our, our world is more obviously an open rebellion against the Word of God. Yeah. Yeah. And when the, the church is in, if they're not in conflict, they're not doing their job. They're not in conflict with the people of God. Yeah, I would say, again, we, we you know, okay, we got to keep in mind on the other side, I struggle when I see churches going out to try to pick a fight. With the world, you know, when, when you look for every opportunity to what? To, you know, you know, it's like when, when I was a kid, my younger brother, okay? So my younger brother, he would come up, if he, maybe he'll watch this sometime and call me up. My younger brother, I used to be, I used to be sitting there, and my brother would be, we'd be watching TV, and he'd go like this. He'd reach over with his finger, he'd reach over, and he'd touch my shoulder. He'd just reach over and touch my shoulder. And I said, knock it off, and then move his hand. And he'd reach over, and he'd just touch, and he'd touch my arm, just like this, just a little tiny touch. And look at him, he pulled back. And he kept on touching me. And, and what would happen is then all of a sudden he'd keep on touching me, and then I would wail on him, right? And then he'd go crying to mom, and then I'd get in trouble. And then he'd laugh. And I remember one time he was doing it, my dad's watching it, and I said, knock it off. And he did it, and I turned, and I just wailed on it on his arm, and he started crying, and then he went to mom, and he's, my dad grabs it. No, 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 you had it coming, right? <laughs> so you deal with it. In my humble opinion, I think sometimes the church will what? To the world will go out and what? Touch. Poke the bear. Now, I would say that's not the church militant. That's the church... Ch yeah, how do we say it? <laughs> yeah. What's that? Yeah, the church irritant. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> we got to keep in mind that the suffering of the soul, tentatio is the suffering of the soul. we got to keep in mind that the, the war, the battle comes to us. Okay? The battle comes to us. Yeah, we don't look for crosses to bear. The cross chooses us. Jesus says, take up your cross and follow me. Those crosses, they come to us. They, they, we bear those crosses, they come to us. So we seek peace if possible. In every way, shape, and form, we try to seek peace. But when peace does not happen, it's truth what? At all costs. Even if that means suffering and dying. 
And that is how the church is militant, is that we cling to Christ in spite of what we're told by the rest of the world. Okay? That makes sense? So the persecution comes as a way of from the outside to us. Okay? So we're always what? Attentive. We're awake. We're sober-minded. We're ready to give a defense for the faith um, in who we are. Okay? Then peace comes as a gift. Yeah, peace. And when, and when times are good in the church, we say, God be praised. Right? So if we have peace with the world and there's no, there's no conflict, we're saying, God be praised. But that doesn't give us an excuse to become what? Laxadaisy. Yep, laxadaisy. Yep, yep. Yeah, because what happens when you do that, right? Um, think, okay, think of the Old Testament, right? What happened to the prophets? Okay, the bad prophets in the Old Testament. They said what? Peace, peace, when there was no peace, right? Our peace is in Christ, but in Christ there will be what? Enmity with the world. And we have to be sober-minded about that, that it is a battle and there is war. Okay. And the cross is offensive all by itself. It doesn't need our help. Like he said, if the church is doing what it's supposed to be doing, it's going to yep. be offensive anyway. So we don't need to go out, like you said, poke. Yep. You know. um, I, just, I just read a report the other day that Tony Dungy, Dun Dun Dungy, am I saying it right? Uh, a long time uh, coach for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Uh, my understanding of him is he's a very, very godly man, uh, very, very gentle man, very, very kind. He posted on Twitter that him and his wife are going to the March of Life, okay? To support what? Little babies in the tummy, to support what? Protecting little babies in the tummy. And the media now is unle unleashing on him, absolutely unleashing on him, demanding that he gets fired or recant. Um, I saw a report the other day, a Russian hockey player uh, for the Philadelphia Flyers, uh, they had a, a pride night and all the players were expected for warm-up to wear rainbow-colored jerseys. And he just said, you know, I'd rather not practice in that jersey. I'm just going to, what, respectfully stay inside. I'm not, not going to make a scene. I'm not going to, what, I'm not going to go out there and burn this jersey. I'm not going to go rip it. I'm, not, I'm just going to stay off ice peacefully and quietly. And then after the warm-ups, I'll come out and not draw attention to it. That was noticed. And now they're calling to fine the Philadelphia Flyers up to a million dollars and uh, bench him and so forth. And he just said what? Because of my Christian faith as a Russian Orthodox, I do not believe in that lifestyle, nor do I want to participate in it. And now what? Enmity. Okay. So the enmity, it comes to you. And when it does, we must be ready to be what? Faithful to truth at all costs. Okay. Make sense? Okay, so why is this battle happening here? We have a lot to cover here in the next seven minutes here. Spirit of Cain versus the church of Abel. This is Genesis 4. <clears throat> okay, Genesis 4 says this. Now Adam knew Eve, his wife. The word knew is to, to have sexual relations. So Adam has sexual relations with Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. And again, she bore his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of the sheep, and Cain a worker of the ground. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground, and Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering he had no regard. So Cain was very angry, and his face fell. The Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry, and why has your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is for you, but you must rule over it. Cain spoke to Abel, his brother, and when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. Okay? That's enmity there. That's Genesis 3.15. That's enmity between what? The offspring of Eve and the devil. So let's go through and, and talk about this. One does not have to look very far to see the enmity between the seed of the serpent and the seed of Eve, Cain and Abel. But what exactly does this enmity look like between evil, the evil seed and godly seed? Consider the following comment from a theologian on this subject. Cain murdered Abel because Cain sought to offer God his own sacrifice. 
The writer to the Hebrews tells us that Abel offered a sacrifice in in anticipation of the final sacrifice of the Lamb of God, and did so by faith rather than by works. However, Cain sought to be justified by his own works. When God accepted Abel instead, Cain became jealous. His hatred for Abel was probably due in part to his own hatred of God for refusing to accept his righteousness. In other words, Abel was killed because of Cain's uncontrollable jealousy of Abel and his hatred towards God for God rejecting his self-generated righteousness. Cain attacked Abel because of his rejection of the gospel. It is true, the doctrine of grace will always result in the wounded getting healed and the self-righteous getting angry. This is not only true historically and biblically speaking, it is true in the world and church today. The spirit of Cain lives on with hostility towards the gospel and the church of Abel. Okay, so Cain ended up killing Abel because of his indignation between him and God that God did not accept his self-generated sacrifice. Abel goes the way of faith. So if we think about Cain and Abel, as Luther points out, there are two different ways of running your spirituality. There are two different churches. The spirit of Abel lives by faith. The spirit of Cain lives by self-generated works righteousness. We look at the spirit of Cain and Abel, we see it through the rest of the Old Testament and into the New Testament. We have that story of Cain and Abel as paired up with the tax collector and the Pharisee. Remember that story of the tax collector and the Pharisee? Uh, there were two men that went to the temple. The, the, the Pharisee, he stands up and he prays to God aloud, Lord God, thank you I'm not like these other people, these tax collectors and these sinners. I tithe once, you know, da-da-da. I give all that I have and look, right? That's the spirit of Cain. The spirit of Abel the, the tax collector, he beat his breast and said, God have mercy on me, the sinner. Those are the two churches. Okay? So, Martin Luther once commented on this section. Okay? In fact, Luther divides the church into two categories, the church of Cain and the church of Abel. Luther states that the church of Cain will always persecute the church of Abel. He states the following, The church begins to be divided into two churches, the one which is the church in name, but in reality is nothing but a hypocritical and bloodthirsty church, and the other one which is without influence, forsaken and exposed to suffering in the cross, and which before the world and in the sight of the hypocritical church is truly able, that is, vanity and nothing. For Christ also calls Abel righteous and makes him the beginning of the church of the godly, which will continue until the end. Similarly, Cain is the beginning of the church of the wicked and of the bloodthirsty until the end of the world. Luther goes on to say, It is both very instructive and very comforting to trace each of the two churches from these men as the originators and to note by what a marvelous plan God has always directed their affairs. At one time, the true church was the greater, at another time, it was the smaller, yet always in such a manner that the hypocritical hypocritical and bloodthirsty church enjoyed honor before the world and crucified the church, which was the true one and was loved by God. Even then, the divine promises began to work itself out, and that the serpent seed bit the heel of the blessed seed, just as we experience today. Therefore, this lot should not frighten us. It should rather be the source of comfort for us to learn from experience that we're being dealt with by our adversary and the way a bloodthirsty king dealt with righteous Abel. The point being, what Luther was making the parallel was this, is in the 1500s you had the church of Abel, which was the reformers, living by grace through faith in Christ alone by his holy word alone. And you had the church of Cain that was what? Attacking the gospel. Attacking the forgiveness of sins. Okay? Wait. Yeah. The spirit of Cain, what Wade said, he's spot on. The spirit of Cain lives within all of us. It's our old Adam. 
Okay, the spirit of Abel is is the faith in Christ, the Holy Spirit at work in us. Okay, and so we pray that we would be the church of Abel, that the spirit of Cain would be continually crucified. There's a little box at the top right there. It says, make no mistake about it. The church is at a battle and it is not hard to track down the church. All you have to do is follow the trail of blood. From the church drips the blood of the martyrs, martyrs at war with the seed of the devil. And I wrote, I preached a sermon many years ago talking about follow the trail of blood. And when you follow the trail of blood, now literally the blood and also figuratively, when you see the suffering, generally speaking, you're going to see the suffering church, which is the church of Abel, that does not have influence in the world. Which church has influence in the world? The church of Cain. The spirit of Cain has influence, has pull in the world. Whereas the church of Abel is typically suffering. But the good news of the gospel is this, is at the very last day, the Lord will what? Separate the sheep and the goats, the church of Cain and the church of Abel, separate the two, and call the church of Abel unto himself to eternal glory. Okay? Make sense? Okay, any brief thoughts? We are actually over, I apologize. Okay, let's pray, and we'll... uh, Continue with things next week here. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have kept me this night from all harm and danger. And I pray that you would keep me this day also from sin and every evil, that all of my doings in life may please you. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul and all things. Let your holy angel be with me that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. Thanks, everyone.